Hello, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for jumping on tonight. Uh, I know it's been a pretty, you know, quick transfer. We we changed from a live venue to <laughs> online, so really appreciate everyone uh, adapting to that and and joining us online on Twitch. Hopefully, it's not too unfamiliar. Um, we're just going to be bringing on Toby Fogarty later on and Frosty to have a chat, and you'll be able to ask questions throughout. Um, in Twitch chat, and I'll, I'll read them out. I'll make sure that they're seen and answered by the relevant people after Toby and Frosty talk a little bit after. Um, I'll jump on and just give a quick overview of the meta season, uh, some key dates and some key information that you might need to get prepared for the season. So without further ado, I'll bring on Toby, and uh, he can talk a little bit about what it's been like bringing esports to his high school. Excellent. Thanks, Woody. Uh, yeah, thanks anyone for, for joining us online, uh, as Woody said, in this uh, change of circumstance. Um, but yeah, I guess potentially opens the audience up for people wider than just the original Adelaide group, which is fantastic. So welcome to everyone, um, depending on where you uh, actually are located uh, in, in <laughs> the country today. Um, I am going to speak to a uh, presentation. I've got a little PowerPoint, so I'm going to cut to that in a second. Uh, just go through, I guess, my own perspectives of um, um, my experience with uh, working in a school setting and esports, and um, yeah, and, and go for there. I'm happy to take questions at any stage. If you pop them in the chat, if I miss them, I know Woody will um, bring me back uh, to those questions uh, at a at a logical moment. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to cut to my PowerPoint presentation uh, and get underway. Switch to me. There's my PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, as I said, my name's, uh, as Woody said, my name's Toby uh, Fogarty. I'm from Northern Adelaide Senior College, which is uh, north of Adelaide in South Australia. Uh, and I'm talking about esports at Northern Adelaide Senior College. So uh, NASC is, um, or as we call it, NASC is an adult reentry high school uh, offering uh, any students that come to our campus, to our school, uh, a chance to complete their South Australian. Certificate of Education or SACE um, through you know, a variety of stage one and two subjects and the combination of uh, vocational education courses. So generally speaking, we have students that are anywhere from about 16 up uh, and there's no actual ceiling uh, on age for the students we have there. Um, more typically, the students that I uh, tend to um, have in my classes range from 16 to sort of mid to late 20s uh, in, our, in, our, in our courses. Um, a little bit about me, I've been working in education for pretty much 20 years. Um, I have been a primary school teacher, a primary school principal, a project officer, seconded teacher, so a bit of work in a school and a bit of work in offices working across many schools. Uh, I've spent 10 or so years working within uh, flexible learning uh, programs for students in various situations across South Australia and more recently the last eight of those years is working in and around senior secondary school so mainly year 11 and 12. Um, I myself personally am quite passionate about gaming like playing games, creating games, watching games and, and other people game uh, and a, you know traditional sport uh, is also included in that uh, so cricket, AFL, rugby and NRL um, I really, really uh, am passionate about uh, broadcasting, uh, live streaming and content creation, specifically um, in contexts for running community-based events. Uh, I also have quite a strong passion about civic-minded pursuits, so I like trying to, at this stage of my life, find ways I can give back to the communities that I live in. Uh, a bit more about me, uh, I am fortunate enough to work uh, as part of a small team of two with a teaching colleague of mine, Mr Ben Ryder, who um, you may or may not see in the background uh, at some stage today. He is working with our students while I sit in the corner uh, and talk to you guys. Um, we run a program called uh, AGFA, or um, the Academy of Gaming, Film and Animation uh, in our high school, which is uh, where we deliver a bit of a combination of uh, say slot, so set normal South Australian curriculum and VET uh, learning at both stage one and stage two levels or year 11 and 12 uh, and we focus on many things in a blended program um, specifically 3D modeling and animation 
game and game art design, uh, event management, live streaming and production for esports, and a little bit of music as well uh, in terms of events in both our local school and uh, regional communities. Uh, on any given week in my school, uh, specifically in our classrooms, you could find students taking part in informal lunchtime clubs focused on gaming, uh, both you know, electronic uh, and tabletop, uh, you know, card based and whatnot, or role play as well. Um, we have many students who participate in an after school esports club, which we run once a week, um, which for the last couple of years has incorporated uh, participation in meta esports tournaments. Um, we also have uh, many students drawing on their passion for gaming and esports to influence their learning, so including uh, certificate level courses for 3D modeling and animation and game design, as well as learning about the live production that focuses heavily on uh, local esports uh, events, and sometimes when we're lucky, uh, a little bit um, larger than that. Um, and we have many of our students volunteer their time outside of normal school hours, prepping for and delivering community-based esports events, which are quite often in partnership with different local government groups uh, that we live near or sometimes not so near, but are in South Australia. Last year alone, uh, we had students give up evenings and weekends to work as a part of the Ag for Esports team to host and deliver uh, four community land holiday programs at, in different holiday periods, one uh, larger Rocket League tournament, a five round FIFA 19 tournament across four council regions with a state final. Um, we hosted, ran and live streamed the regional final for SA for Meta, we were lucky enough to do that. Uh, and then we also entered two open and one beginner teams in the Meta League of Legends tournament. Unfortunately, we didn't get a team in the Rocket League, uh, although we are working hard to try and rectify that this year. Uh, I have a bit of a video now, which I'm going to cut to. Uh... So this video is um, like two specific events that our students have been involved with planning and running. The first one that you're seeing here is a, a large 12 hour LAN party that we ran. We had about 130 people with them uh, and, and had a really excellent day. Uh, we had many different sports, lots of prizes, you know, music pumping, good food, good times, but it was completely run by our student classes. So they learned more about the event management and planning and delivery and dealing with you know, customers and participants as well. And then we were lucky enough to work with uh, TBD Productions and Meta uh, to help uh, run and produce the first National Rocket League Grand Final, so not last year's but the year before, um, and that was held in Adelaide uh, at the Entertainment Centre um, as part of what we called Hybrid World Adelaide. Uh, so many of our students were involved in the production team and a couple of them were also casting, so on the stage there on the left uh, is one of my students who, um, through his you know, learning and involvement with esports at our school, uh, was working on his skills as a, as a shoutcaster. Uh, and that's just two examples of how esports uh, has sort of worked its way into not only our curriculum, um, but also after, after school pursuits. Okay, back to my PowerPoint. So um, I guess that the you know one of the big things that we was hoping that I could probably elaborate on was my perspective of uh, benefits and opportunities that I see and observe to, I guess, both myself and my students and my school community uh, a little wider. And uh, from my perspective, there's been many benefits and opportunities um, that have come from being involved in esports and having that in our school community. Uh, and, and I'll talk to a few of them now. So um, a sense of community uh, that is amongst our students who enjoy both uh, enjoy gaming both competitive competitively and socially uh, 
which has come from you know having esports in school and I guess the school wider than our specific group of you know people that we call gamers um, have uh, increased their recognition of gaming areas within the campus. Um, so they understand that their school is made up from you know, a significantly large proportion of people that would associate with gaming in some form and esports uh, as part of that. So that more formal competitive gaming. Um, with the school has a greater understanding uh, of gaming and esports and the number of students who regularly do that. Um, there's lots of opportunities for students now to meet others uh, in, on the campus whom they perhaps have not met before, but who share the same passions. Uh, and we do this during school-based sessions, so they come along because they know that you know at a certain time on a certain day there's something happening in one of the rooms, uh, and they can come along and you know participate or just even chill and watch and talk to other people, but talk about gaming, esports, pop culture, um, you know, the, the people in that room at those times will pretty much always have the same passions. Uh, more benefits and opportunities um, from a, a teacher's perspective, like from myself and uh, my colleague Ben, it's like we get to have, our, you know, better discussions and debates and reviews that we can now have based on gaming, esports and pop culture topics. Um, you know, for example, uh, in this week alone, um, topics of conversation are heavily uh, based around set three galaxies in Team Fight Tactics. Get excited, boys! Let's go! Um, and, and you know whether whether we like that or not, and you know how we think that's working or not. Um, I myself am very excited by that, and am trying to spend time where I have some, which is not heaps at the moment this week, uh, to get my placement done and try and march my rank back towards the plat that I got to last season. Um, so, yeah, yeah, but, you know, in terms of uh, common topics of discussion between students and staff, like, we, we talk about the same things because we enjoy the same things, and I think that gives opportunities for different types of discussions um, with students that perhaps were not um, available to us, to us before. Um, Again, from a teaching perspective, we see that there's opportunities for comparisons using the concept of performance review from esports participation and, and trying to relate that and compare that to um, how you can use the same type of strategies for performance review in curriculum and learning outcomes. Um, what we find is that the students that we work with who, who game um, and, and in our esports programs um, are becoming quite good at reviewing performance both individually and as a team and sort of breaking down things that went well and areas for improvement and I guess what we try and do is have conversations with them to see if we can get them to make comparisons between that process and what they do which clearly works for them as well as um, you know how they could then move that into other areas of their life you know other areas of work other areas of um, gaming and whatnot uh, sorry, other areas of curriculum uh, or whatnot, uh, and, and get that same sort of performance uh, increase from reviewing stuff in a, in a different way. Uh, we also think there's opportunities to have discussions with students about the strategies they use to learn new games and skills. Uh, so again, you know, set three right now, we're all trying to learn different combos, and um, we um, are trying to, you know, decide what's good, what's not, what's busted, what's not. So, you know, how can I fit Thresh into my uh, into my combination when I'm not building into the, into that you know, because Thresh is broken in TFT, for anyone who knows that. But, you know, we, we, we're trying to um, figure out how uh, skills that we use to learn things quickly uh, in gaming situations and esports situations, how can we apply that to other areas in, in learning and life in general? Because uh, we observe that our students are sometimes very good at picking up skills and stuff quickly for gaming, and if they could, you know, use that in all areas, that could be something really uh, powerful and um, you know interesting for them. So more benefits and opportunities. Um, communication, like communication, is super important in esports, as we probably all uh, know, but it's also you know really important in in most areas of life, really. Um, so it's an opportunity for us to try and model effective communication and in particular under times of pressure uh, and, and you know in specifically looking at the benefits to performance in esports settings of effective communication uh, versus just shouting at each other.
which doesn't always work and just leaves people tilted, which is not always a good experience. Um, and not always helpful when you're trying to, you know, prove to the school that this is a valid part of your school program. Um, but, you know, effective communication is required in, in everyday life. Uh, so the better you can um, iterate your points uh, in a calm manner, even under times of pressure, the better um, the outcome for you and the experience with yourself and the other people that you are, you know, communicating with. Uh, and we also find over the last, oh, I think, five years, we could say, we've had involvement with gaming and some esports and probably the last three to three and a half, more specifically, formal esports, uh, both as participants and um, hosts, we find that students have increased opportunities to experience and cultivate media presence um, when participating in formal events, like whether they're online or in the room. Uh, and again, developing skills in communication, but also presentation on public speaking, which is, you know, public speaking's everyone's favourite uh, thing uh, to do. But, you know, it, it, there's, it, it's one of those things that with, with practice comes confidence and with confidence comes less anxiety about doing it. And, and you can sort of, you know, work on that as a skill the same way you can work on becoming a better gamer. Um, and there's you know, also many, many additional technical skills uh, in IT and production that come from being involved uh, with esports, whether it's just in your class at lunchtime or um, you know, on weekends when you're running events for other people. Um, that's about all I have for um, specific things to talk to. So I, I can sort of see the chat to the right of me popping up with some questions, so I'm hoping now, Woody, if I switch back to you, you might be able to fire some of those questions and we can see if we can um, answer those, maybe? Definitely, definitely. I, I found it really interesting right. that you talked a bit about the, the wider aspects of esports, not just, you know, playing in a team and competing and learning from a, you know, in-game performance perspective, but also the media aspects. How do you put on a stream a broadcast what does the presenter do and these are all yeah. aspects around esports that uh, students can learn from and, and execute on themselves as well so that that's really interesting so the let's jump into some questions uh the first one here is from uh shadowy misstep uh, i think i had that right uh, in terms of infrastructure have colleges or schools given real in brackets, mostly financial support behind these clubs is there more support for esports considering the competitive aspect or gaming in general Mm, that's a, a good question. Um, I would say that from my perspective in the school that I am in, um, we have had uh, good support um, in being allowed to uh, set up lunchtime clubs uh, and explore um, like esports more generally outside of school hours as part of our programs, um, which is primarily like from like hosting and delivering and, and setting up tournaments and stuff like that. But um, I think um, having that flexibility, even whether it's you know financial or otherwise, is still a big thing in schools. Like being able to um, you know, have freedom to go and explore partnerships with uh, other esports uh, production people or tournament hosts or local councils, which is a big one for us, um, is is huge. Um, we have had some. Um, small financial uh, assistance. Like we're, we're really lucky in a sense that because we run the curriculum programs that we do for uh, 3D modelling and game design and, and some production stuff anyway, um, that plays into like the hands of, of, of being able to be supported in kind to run esports in our site um, because we, we have, you know, outside of the box, I would say, PCs that we use uh, for our everyday work which also mean that they are, you know, pretty decent to uh, play games on as well, uh, as opposed to like a, you know, a cheese toasty um, laptop that you might get from an average library, um, which maybe won't run games very well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so that's something. Um, yeah, I guess we, we partner with some local councils as well, uh, and they often have funding for youth-based programs, and they are always keen, in my experience, to explore... Uh, esports and gaming uh, on a social level, whether it's non-competitive or competitive, um, a lot more than they have done previously. Yeah, and just uh, from my perspective, uh, looking at some schools across the program, uh, when it comes to support, it's still 
you know, early days, esports isn't quite as well understood by many school leaderships. Uh, but the the good thing with a lot of the games that you know we offer and esports games in general is that the the specs required aren't super high, and and some of these games are free to play. So um, as long as you have uh, you know the computers there and the the permission to play games, then there's an opportunity to install the games and just organize around what you already have and, and slowly build that up. Um, Shadowy Misstep did have a follow-up question. Has there been any options to reach out to Osh Talent, Spawn, or the OPL comes to mind? Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we have, at some of the events we've run, have um, some... Uh, not OS, I think OPL uh, yeah. or former OPL teams come to our events. Uh, I know that when we've run some league tournaments, we have had some SA-based guys that perhaps now are on uh, OPL roster and not in Adelaide anymore come to those events and participate. So there is that connection between players uh, in that local community event. Uh, I also see, uh, should I miss that, um, councils. So when I say councils, I, I guess I'm talking about uh, local government. So... Um, yeah, like city, not uh, not state or federal. Yeah, and and when it comes to OPL, you know, we try to collaborate and coordinate between them as well, um, where possible. You know, they show some of our highlights and talk about the high school league on their production, and and we try to to get them to help. You know, bring up that next generation of not only uh, competitor and player, but also uh, commentating talent. Um, I know on their website, Learn with League. Uh, which I'm sure is useful even if you're in uh, North America. They have a lot of great resources on that website, and they've also uh, released kind of a short video, kind of shoutcasting 101, and it takes you through the basics. And I know Froskur and Spawn and a couple of others are on there talking about their journey and what they think you should do if you want to get into shoutcasting. So, so they've done a bit there, and I'm sure there are lots of opportunities to work with local leagues, whether it's the OPL or LCS Academy, um, to to collaborate and create opportunities for schools and students together as you know high school esports continues to grow. Uh, Robla had a question as well. Uh, how do you structure your lunchtime activities? Uh, I have around 50 students involved in my esports club, but only get two lunches a week with only 25 PCs available. Okay, yeah, that's hard. Um, I mean, first thing off the bat, you've got 50 students that want to come and do esports at lunchtime. That's amazing. Like, that's really cool. Uh, what an opportunity. Um, I think that um, you know, things that we do here, uh, you know, if there's many, many people at, in a lunchtime, we might uh, try to roster stuff, um, but that's not something we've had to stress about before. Um, we've got about 30 uh, gaming PCs, and then I have... Uh, consoles as well, so I have two switches, four playstations, two Xboxes. Uh, each have many, many controllers. We've got like, I think it, if I look behind me, there's about five TVs in my room set up in different spots as well. So I can accommodate um, more people than I have PCs because consoles, you know, with a switch, for example, I can, with the right dock, have eight people playing a, a game at once, you know, huddled around the TV. So that would help to alleviate some of the stress we're trying to. You know, engage 50 people actively in a lunchtime. Now, that obviously means there's, you know, in that situation in a lunchtime, you, you might need to, you know, lean on the students and, and help train some of your more senior students up to help uh, set up and facilitate stuff quickly, either just before lunch or at the start of that lunch session. Um, but certainly not impossible. Uh, um, yeah, so I'd say, like, you know, if you only have 25 PCs, you could look at scheduling or rostering, or you could also look at uh, including some consoles into that mix as well. Switch is a really good, um, a really good way to do that, and they're not massively costly. And you know, if you have the dock and the TV, uh, often we find students will pull a switch out of their bag and put it on said dock, and then away they go. Uh, <laughs> so that that can help also. Um, yeah. So uh, I think also like we do stuff after school as well, which gives us that bit of flexibility in terms of time, because if you know there's many people and it's excited as long as like Ben, my colleague, and I are happy to stay back a little bit. Um, you know, we might spill over from a 3.30 to 4.30 session. It might go to 5 or sometimes a bit later. And certainly when Meta uh, kicks off, uh, like our Tuesday sessions with when league runs, um, we'll be in here longer as well. So some of our students, probably half of our students um, across the you know two or three teams that we'll have, 
choose to game from our room because we are very lucky at our school to have um, some pretty decent internet um, that comes in on a fibre connection. So you know, the students will choose to use that. You know, often yeah. bring, bring in their own peripherals, but yeah, choose to use the computers and stuff here. Um, that's that's awesome cool. to hear. I, it's it's interesting that you say you know when you have the TV set up that some students will have the consoles on them, especially the portable switch, and yeah. um, they might be able to contribute and support infrastructure in that way. You know when you might only have twenty five computers, if you do have a TV here or there that could hook up to a Nintendo Switch, um, it might be that some of your students already have a couple of them. So. If you can't get the support to to get hardware straight away, uh, maybe students might have some that that you can use in the meantime, which offers kind of multiplayer capabilities, especially with yeah. the Switch. I, I um, think schools can buy like docks um, without the Switch as well. So you can have docks, and you know we know we get cabled controllers um, that are not expensive at all by any means. So you could have some of those extra peripherals, but students could still bring Switches and then also the games as well. Yeah, uh, and them. but if you stick to things like Smash and Mario Kart and you know Rocket League and stuff like that, that's multiplayer, single screen, uh, good ratings, like generally accepted by schools. Yeah, Robla had a follow-up question of, in terms of your setup specifically. Uh, you know, how was the finance? Was it through the school, or were these helped by sponsorships? Uh, through the school. So we, we when we first kicked off maybe five years ago, um, we, we applied for a you know curriculum budget the same way as any other subject would. Uh, and then I guess through our um, students and uh, giving up our time on weekends and whatnot and working with uh, local councils um, to run events for them, they have been able to, I guess, uh, in, like we can invoice from the school and the council have, you know, they have small budgets, but small budgets are big money um, for us. So, you know, what is not very much money in, in, in the real world means a lot to us because it means we can buy, you know, our PlayStation or our Switch or some controllers. And we've just been chipping away at it um, for that past five years. Uh, you know, we, we take good care of our stuff. Um, I am super vigilant on looking for sales and bargains all the time, <laughs> all the time. Um, uh, anytime, you know, we can sort of get something for cheaper or for two for one or, you know, second hand, like look at your um, uh, eBay, you know, Gumtree, Facebook Marketplace and whatever else uh, and, you know, talk to your school's finance team. Um, I, I think we, we just really wanted it to happen, so we just really did whatever we could. To, to build it up and, and, and get, you know, bits of equipment and whatnot um, that we knew we were going to get good uh, good use out of. And so so you mentioned, obviously, it's been uh, a few years now, but um, talk can you talk a little bit to what that conversation was like in terms of getting it into uh, the curriculum or getting the resources for the computers? How yeah. did you convince the school? What, what did you talk about uh, there? I guess uh, initially, like... Um, like my colleague Ben and myself were teaching, you know, regulation subjects uh, in isolation of each other, but we had like common students uh, between the two classes, and, and we had conversations. So, um, and, and you know, we would talk to each other, you know, at the end of the week, going, "Oh, what about this student? What about that student? They showed me this. They showed me that. That's really amazing." And we pretty much figured out pretty quickly that we have similar cohorts of students, if not the same students themselves, uh, and that. We all talked about exciting things that weren't actually officially part of our curriculum, but wish they could be. So we, we just sort of brainstormed, came up with some some practical ideas, but also some crazy ones, uh, and put it together into a bit of a pitch. And went to the principal and went, "Look, like we, you know, we we, we think we have an idea um, where we, if we pushed all our classes together, we could run like a you know a program across a couple of days that is not." on a you know regular high school timetable but is like with the same two staff and the same big group of students for a few days a week uh, and, and we want to throw all these other things like 3D modeling and game design and you know all, all, all different stuff into that program and build our learning around that. Uh, we had a few meetings, we talked to them, they um, they didn't say no straight away. Like you know, <laughs> I think because we'd put some time into planning and we, we had like an official um, you know pitch where we looked at like we think this subject package could work and this is how we would try and do it. Um, they sort of uh, let us um, trial it for six months, 
Uh, and once they let us trial it, that was it. Like, we just really hit the ground running and, and knew that, you know, we wanted this because I love teaching this. It's amazing coming to school and having conversations about games and esports and, you know, I've made this model, look at my texture, I made this blueprint work for this mechanic, it's insane. Um, you know, can anyone believe the latest skin on this character? Like, what are they thinking? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know. Yeah, um, awesome. Yeah, so th they didn't say no, but I think, yeah, they didn't say no based on the fact that we didn't just have a conversation of passing. Like, we put a little bit of time into um, being strategic about what we were taking to them as an idea. We wrote some stuff down and linked it to curriculum. Awesome. Linking it to curriculum sounds really important. Uh, Shadow Misstep has another question. Is inter-school engagement, competitions, I don't know what else, maybe there are some other things we could do, are possible for you? Yeah, totally. Uh, I guess with our esports club, when it's not meta season in previous years and hopefully again this year, um, I have been lucky enough to link to some other schools based on staff members that I know and used to work with in regional parts of South Australia um, to, you know, have scrims. And so that's a combined student teacher like thing sometimes where we all just go, how many people do we have? There's 10, right, let's make two mixed teams of those. and and have a scrim and just play some games. So we've done that. Uh, often with our um, competitions that are at local council venues, like we will advertise through schools as well and you get a combination of like school teams that might also play in a meta competition. For example, the last Rocket League tournament we did late last year, some of the teams were um, you know, young people from the community. And when I say young people, I mean up to like mid to late 20s. Um, some were from unis and TAFEs, uh, some were teams, like one team in particular, um, I know was an actual meta team because I had them at the grand final or the regional final that we hosted in South Australia. So it, it's open to teachers, uh, to students from other schools to come and play in those competitions, even though they're not, um, not necessarily like, you know, school-based competitions that school teams can still enter into them and into school stuff we're always keen to try and find other schools to swim with not just for league for any game yeah sounds like uh, Robla is actually a teacher from northern adelaide school so looks like there's yeah, an opportunity oh, there Robo, to okay oh Robo, we might link uh, yeah <laughs> we might message can i be cheeky and ask is uh Robler on the uh meta um discord at all uh, I hope so, and yeah, yeah I'm sure we can find a way not. to connect you two <laughs> to make yeah, that happen. Yeah. But um, yeah, totally. We oh, excellent. Perfect. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I will happily jump over there after stream and and uh, say hi and see if we can organise a time to figure stuff out because we've got a few things. Well, we had a few things on the horizon scheduled in, uh, and we're just probably working on what that looks like. Uh, so they might change from being in the room events to being uh, online events instead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, given the circumstances, things are pretty guess, crazy. Yeah. But yeah. the good thing, I guess, with gaming and esports is it can be done online. Absolutely. From the safety of your own room, as we are doing this right broadcast. Now. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, so, are there any more questions from the chat uh, for Toby? Uh, you know, he's a teacher, so if there's anything specific you want to ask when it comes to how he got involved in school or curriculum or, you know, how how it's impacted students, maybe um, now's the time to ask. I'll give it a few more few more minutes. But maybe one question from me is, you know, how, how have your students found it? Do you, do you see that they're maybe more engaged in high schools or uh, um, we, have, we, they, have they, I guess the question for me is have they uh, not only seen engagement in your course curriculum, but have they engaged with the school more in other subjects as well? Yeah, I would have to say yes. Uh, we sort of look at the attendance data and whatnot, or even just the ability to engage students when they are here if their attendance is not consistent all the time mm. through, you know, whatever reasons, because there's always lots of reasons as to why that's not possible in our context, um, but we, we have found over the years, and, and um, you know, we know this because external parties in our school also make this observation and ask us about it, that students that are involved in our programs, uh, whether that's just um, lunch times or lunch times plus curriculum or lunch times plus curriculum plus uh, you know, external events, uh, tend to keep coming back. 
and, and you know, specifically, there's a good crossover between students that come to our lunchtime events, you know, you know, eventually dip their toe into doing some of our curriculum as well. Yeah, awesome, not 100%, awesome. percent but at least 50, I reckon. That's great. That's great. I'm sure, you know, as they continue to grow and learn more uh, and the program continues to grow, more students will get involved as well. Thank yeah, you so right. much, yeah. Toby, for ah, cool. jumping on. Oh, we actually have one more question. Yeah. Uh, so do you suggest students being a certain year level to participate in the competition? We have a lot of year seven and eight students interested. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I'd have to, like, I can't specifically relate to that question based on where I am now because as I said earlier in the stream, like we're a senior secondary school only, but obviously uh, I have worked in primary schools before and I have children of my own. Um, so I'd say yes, but with the caveat of what game are you playing? Know? Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's the big thing always to me. It, you know, it's like consuming any sort of media or content. It's like, have you seen this movie? It's like, well, no. My son's this age, so probably you know we might wait a bit before <laughs> we show them that content. Um, the, the same thing applies with games to me. But you know, none of the games that we play really, I think, um, are, are too worrying to me. I mean, uh, often when we go to community lands in the holidays or we get a much younger audience as well and that's what uh, we have a combination so we would run things like uh, Rocket League, FIFA, um, we would have Smash Bros, we would have Mario Kart, we would have like a VR in the room normally as well and do some mm -hmm. Beat Saber or some other uh, like car sim based games on that uh, and what our students sort of um, do is make custom Minecraft servers to play on LAN as well and that is super popular. Um, so they have much fun using uh, Pixelmon mods, like we, you know, combined Minecraft with Pokemon, and you know, Minecraft with Hunger Games, and Minecraft and all, you know, building and just you know, lots of different things. There's lots of different things, yeah, um, that you can do. Like Rocket League is a fantastic game to start off. It is. It's it it's is. really easy to pick up. Like if you don't know anything about it, you know, it's soccer with cars. <laughs> like you know, I think you know, as some of the other. Uh, people in the chat have said now Rocket League is kind of all ages and even yeah. in the professional scene there are some pro players that are quite young because of that fact um, League of Legends is rated M here in Australia mm. um, so some schools uh, you know have it where you just get a permission slip from parent just to make sure everyone's okay and cool with it um, it's not uh, a sh first person shooter or anything like that so we find a lot of parents and schools are more uh, accepting of League of Legends, even though it it does have that M rating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, right now for Meta, anyway, uh, we do NBA 2K, Rocket League, and League of Legends, and I think um, League of Legends is the only one that has that M rating. The other two yeah. are are more all ages, so so that's good. Yeah, I would have to say that anything that we've ever had to think carefully about before, and it wasn't in a school setting, it was in a community setting, it was Counter Strike. Uh, and we just had to put like a different age rating on that. You know, people just signed a permission form, and everyone was 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 happy with that. But yeah, yeah, I think that you know that's an interesting note there where we might be able to discuss at a different point. But in the esports and gaming community, uh, games like Call of Duty, CS:GO, um, even Overwatch, Fortnite, these are big games that a lot of people play. Uh, a lot of people play, a lot of high school students probably play, um, and it's just about finding the right way to to engage parents and schools in those games, you know, waiting for the right time, making sure uh, governments and teachers and schools understand uh, the approach people are taking. Now might not be that time given the youth of esports and, and where it's at, but, you know, it is a big market and a big uh, number of players that, that play that. So it's just about, for us at Meta, it's, it's always been about, hey, we know a lot of students, a lot of high school students play games in esports. How can we use that passion to help school attendance, school engagement, and bring them into a structured team-based environment rather than you know playing just with friends casually at home? So it's just a case of finding the best way to, to bring that to life. And Rocket League and League of Legends are a great starting point to, to dip our toes in, get students involved, get schools involved. And maybe one day uh, we'll be able to address that other side of the market when it comes to shooters. But yeah, Rainbow Six is another very popular game that's uh, 
tough to talk about when when it comes to school leadership and governments right now but but one day maybe yeah. um so thank you so much toby for jumping on today he'll he'll be no hanging worries. around so if there's any yeah, more questions we'll chat for him um he'll be he'll be around um next up we'll we'll bring in frosty to chat a little bit about his journey he's a professional player for legacy esports folks on hearthstone i know he's playing a bit of the new order chase genre as well but he'll he'll talk a little bit about i guess his journey his experience from esports and and how he's felt about it all thank you frosty uh, hello everyone, how are we all doing today? I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today. It's a pleasure to be talking to you all. Uh, my name is Frosty, as Woody has kindly already introduced me, uh, otherwise known as uh, Dylan O'Malley. I go by either or these days simply because uh, my gaming name is pretty much synonymous with my actual name. Uh, I'm used to people calling me either or, to be honest. Um, I am a professional Hearthstone player. I have been for the past five years, and I've been involved within esports for the past 10 years or so, uh, ever since I was in high school. And it's uh, been a pretty wild ride for the most part. I've learned a lot of things from esports uh, that I, I have actually been able to apply to the real world quite a bit. So I'm looking forward today to be able to talk to you about these sorts of things and to be able to shed some light on the uh, intricacies of esports and not only how to get into it, but also what you can get out of it, not only as a teacher, but from a player side of things as well, as I've, I feel like I've got a lot to share here. Uh, so I'd like to start off by saying that uh, when I was growing up, uh, my childhood uh, was a little bit rough. I was moving from place to place. And because of this, it didn't allow me to make a lot of friends uh, very consistently. You know, I'd uh, start off in uh, Victoria, then I'd move over to Adelaide, then back to Perth, then over to Adelaide again. And because of this, it was hard to get a lot of friends to stick. But the one thing that did stick through all this time was the gaming, right? Gaming was always there. It was always a consistent and it had always been a passion of mine ever since I was growing up. You know, me and my father, we had a lot of bonding experiences simply through, you know, just playing a game or two, you know, having a random Mario Kart together. That was always a way that we would be able to interact with each other and be able to enjoy each other's time. And due to that, it, it really stuck with me. You know, I really appreciate those moments, even in this day and age. You know, thinking back 20 years, there are still some of the fondest memories that I've had. Uh, now, where this all relates to is uh, moving forward a few years in high school and when finally settled down, uh, I had found myself in a weird position simply because I was moving around so much that it was very hard for me to connect with a lot of other students simply because uh, I'm a very competitive person. Uh, I don't know if that comes across very much, but I am generally a person who I love to compete. I love to play games. I love to win. All right. That's a that's a big thing. I love to win. I love to, you know, there's a lot of joy that comes out of winning here. Um, but through high school, I just, I never really felt like I connected with anyone in the same regard. I knew that a lot of people had passion for gaming, but not really in the same sort of metric that I did. You know, people enjoyed the game, but they didn't enjoy gaming competitively with others. And I knew that people loved to win, of course, but those were the kinds of people who really enjoyed the sports side of things. And while I did enjoy sports, it never really appealed to me that much. Uh, so I ended up having a little bit of a rough high school period there. And it, I, instead of trying to find others to connect with uh, in person, I connected instead online and through gaming forums and meeting new people through games. And that's how I really found my sense of community growing up was uh, through interacting with all these people that I'd met online. And it really taught me a few different things. Number one is that interacting with people online is not the same as interacting with people in person. I really wish that I had something growing up uh, like Meta has going on right now. Just we had Toby speaking before. Uh, I really wish that I had something like that in my high school, simply because it would have given me uh, a way to connect with others that I really never felt like I had before. And it was very tough for me to try to reach out to others. Um, and number two is that it was actually uh, meeting new friends online, on the other hand, is actually great as well because I have some friends online that I've known for a good six, seven years 
that I have never met in person. And it wasn't until the end of last year in which I had known two other Australian players uh, for a good long time. And we'd finally decided to meet up. Now, I know, you know, growing up, you get taught if you meet strangers online, you don't <laughs> meet them in person. You know, that's the sort of thing that we're going with here. But I, I've known these people for quite a long time. But uh, unfortunately, circumstances that just never happened so that we'd been ever able to meet up at the same event. So we took time out, had a wonderful weekend together, and I was able to really appreciate everything that had led up to this moment in time where, you know, I hung out with these people, gotten up with them at 5 a.m. in the morning to, you know, start practicing for all these different sorts of events, you know, we'd be there hanging out all through the, every single day. And it got to a point where I felt like I knew these people better than I knew some of my real life friends. Because, of course, I still have real life friends at the time, but I never really had the same sort of connection that I did uh, as I did with uh, these wonderful people that I met online. You know, we, we call each other names. We just have a good laugh about it. it. It was simply a wonderful time. So esports has really given me a, a sense of community as such, where as in a lot of aspects of my life, I never really felt like I connected with others. And I really wish that, as I said before, that I had that opportunity to do it simply because I, I actually enjoy interacting with others in person. You know, I, I actually wish this talk was happening so, you know, I could meet everyone that's ha uh, here today. But unfortunately, it's not the case. Um, but I suppose I'll actually talk about some of the other skills that I've learned as well, you know, simply because I can't I can't just write on about the community aspect of it. I've met so many different people online and meeting people is always the best part of going to events. It's no longer just about the game. Uh, when going to traveling to uh, North, uh, not North Korea, that would be a little bit, oof, a little bit disastrous there. Um, uh, traveling to South Korea, traveling to Thailand, traveling to America. I've met all these different wonderful people and it's really given me a sense of community. So I've been really lucky in that aspect to be able to meet up with a whole bunch of different people. But, um, I suppose I'll talk about some of the things that I've actually been translating back into real life uh, sort of examples here as little skills that I've picked up. Um, so I suppose I'll start with the biggest one, which is public speaking. Uh, I hated public speaking. And there's a little bit of me that still gets nervous over it. But I found that through esports and being able to properly convey a message is one of the most important skills that you can learn because nobody really wants to misinterpret you, especially when you get into a proper role. A lot of eyes can come on to you. And so it's important to be able to speak properly, be able to convey your message across just like I'm doing right now. Now, I used to be the sort of student that would do everything and anything to get out of a class talk. Uh, class vi uh, sick bay visits were fairly frequent. Uh, but as I started getting a little bit more confidence and being able to talk and do all these different sorts of things, had a little bit of media training in there as well, I've tended to find that uh, talking in front of crowds is no longer uh, too much of a problem anymore. As I said before, still a little bit of nervousness there, as I'm sure everyone knows that public speaking is not exactly everyone's favorite thing, but still a very important aspect of it. Uh, Another thing is I've learned persistence. Now, if anyone, and I'm sure everyone has had this experience with trying to find a job before, where you've tried to hand in a resume, you think that you've got everything down pat, and the employer comes back to you and says, sorry, we're just looking for someone different. Well, that is pretty much the exact same experience as trying to find a team uh, in an esports community, where you may think that you've got the perfect a bill for everything that you have that you know you're a highly regarded person within the scene and they may just come back to you and say sorry you're australian we can't afford you because flying to all these different events is just simply costing us too much so it's really off-putting having that happen as i'm sure a lot of you would know but one of the things that it's taught me is well, not to give up on it. you got to keep trying to find all these different sorts of positions that are able to be filled and try to really put your name out there. I suppose in that regard, it's also 
teaching you to, well, put your name out there, you know, be a little bit more assertive about, well, perhaps not assertive, but uh, uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for here? A little bit more forthcoming about trying to put your name out there, you know, and get out there and, you know, don't wait for anything to come to you because in the esports, a lot of the time, you can't wait for someone to come to you. You've got to seek out opportunities for yourself, right? Esports is still in its infancy right now. So we've been going for about a good 25, 30 ish years at this point. So still relatively new in the scale of things. So there are a lot of opportunities out there for anybody who wants to put their name out there. But you've got to seek out these opportunities. Even if you're the best player in the world, unless you say that you know you're interested in doing something for the most part no one's going to come to you unless you put your name out there to do it so persistence and trying to uh, be a little bit well again a little sort of but putting your name out there is probably a better way of putting it uh, is really important within the scene so you can try to open up a lot more opportunities for yourself in that regard uh, media training is also a very big deal in trying to get your name out there simply because uh, a lot of presence these days happens within media but you also got to learn how to conduct yourself as well uh, you'll find if you go to conventions like TwitchCon and even uh, locally say PAX Oz that these are not only opportunities for friends to get together and to have these wonderful sort of events but it's also uh, I find a lot of business is conducted there where streamers will not only be able to talk with developers, but also hand out business cards as such. And it's very interesting the way that uh, business is conducted these days, where it is very much, it's not only just uh, a face on the internet, it's building a brand and, you know, being able to, well, make yourself bigger as a part of esports here and, you know, get your name out there again. It's a very big part of it all. So I suppose I'll finish up by saying here that the biggest lesson that I've learned in esports is that there's always something to learn, right? And keeping a closed mindset about it all is perhaps one of the most negative things that you can do. As I said before, it's still in its infancy. So uh, being open to new ideas and new roles that may pop up uh, is a very important thing. Now, one of the things that I've learned personally from this and relates directly back to the game that I play is that there's a lot of theory craft that goes on behind it. You know, you hear students talking about, you know, what they think is good, what they think is not good. And it's a very important part of that is trying to keep ideas open because if you keep a closed mindset, you'll tend to find that you don't succeed because of it, right? Always keeping an open mindset is perhaps one of the most important things that I can recommend to anybody who's not only trying to get into esports, but just for the scene in general. So uh, I suppose for me, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you've got any questions, please feel free to post them in chat. I'll quickly have a quick read out of them and we'll uh, we'll see if we can't, you know, try to answer some stuff. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Uh, maybe you can pop me back on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rusty. Um, thanks for giving that explanation. How's uh, tell me a little bit about you know while we wait for some potential questions to flow in a little bit about the experience of not only having to be a professional player but also having to be a streamer and personality as well online. Uh, I've typically found that. Uh, not only being a pro player, but also a streamer and a personality is pretty much interwoven at this point where you'll find that a lot of the best pro players are not only, you know, playing professionally these days, but also uh, having the ability to market themselves and put themselves out there is a huge deal for a lot of them. Uh, I know that personally myself, uh, as a very self-reflective person, definitely an area I can improve on. Uh, but uh, I typically find that a healthy work-life balance is also very important in there as well. Uh, not only being able to compete as well, but also typically finding time outside of that 
uh, also a very important part in there as well. I, yeah. You know, I teach martial arts uh, two days a week. I do martial arts another two days a week. I find time to go to the gym. Uh, it's I typically find that that part is also interwoven as to being a part of a pro player where it's, you know, not only knowing the systems, but knowing your boundaries as well and being able to set them and knowing some self-control and typically just trying to be a healthy person, right? And there's a lot of negative stigma that goes around gaming with being a very unhealthy activity. You know, you sit in your room for hours on end, typically try to avoid that sort of business simply because it is not healthy in a lot of aspects if you're just sitting in your room for 16 hours on end. And being able to get up and take breaks is a very important aspect of it all. Yeah, awesome. Uh, there's a few questions here from Shadow. We missed it. Looks like he's a, he or she's a big fan. Uh, <laughs> Do you think there are unique challenges in being an esports competitor in OSH compared to perhaps North America or Europe? Uh, absolutely, I do. I think that uh, perhaps one of the biggest ones is that I feel like compared to other regions in uh, around the world, say North America, Europe, say even uh, South Korea, the, the scene here isn't as developed as it is elsewhere. And so thus, you have to seek out uh, different opportunities as such, or if not seek them out, you have to create your own simply so that uh, you can, like, uh, what am I trying to say? You can open yourself up to these different sorts of opportunities, right? Uh, a lot of the different things is that you'll typically find is that different games are popular in different regions in the world. So for example, uh, strategy games uh, in Australia are typically less popular you'll find than some of the more popular shooters such as uh, Overwatch, Counter-Strike, uh, Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, so uh, there are different uh, aspects when it comes to it and it's all about trying to understand the landscape and trying to work your way around it rather than trying to just brute force something and seeing if it sticks. Yeah. Um... Another question from Shadowy Misstep. Considering how esports is very face forward, do you think there are opportunities for those behind the scenes, such as production or, or management and orgs? Absolutely. I think that uh, production and management is definitely one of the more underlooked side, uh, the underside sort of things, or one of the most uh, uh, looked over sorts of things that happens with it. But I think it's one of the more crucial aspects of it. Uh, and one of the challenges that I feel like a lot of people will face into getting into these roles is that uh, traditional management styles can really struggle within esports. It's not a, a typical landscape that you may find in a workplace where the scene is still sort of booming out here and that uh, it does require a little bit of experience within the scene simply so that you can understand the landscape and then start to try to wrap your head around that sort of thing. Um, but I do definitely think there is a lot of opportunity for that leading up into a lot of different events here. And that, uh, as I said before, uh, in Australia, I think especially that there's a, a huge potential for a lot of esports uh, growth within uh, the country here. And it's all about, you know, trying to find your role and trying to put yourself out there and trying to make opportunities happen. Uh, so if you did want to get into management sort of thing, well, you know, you got to put yourself out there and you got to say, all right, I'm looking to try to do this sort of thing. Let's try to see what we can make happen because otherwise yeah. it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, especially since uh, you're from NA as well, Shadow, we missed it. I think uh, when, when you think about esports organizations globally, a lot of the business model revolves around the, the kind of marketing and sponsorship aspect of it all. Um, so when we talk about production, that's, of course, you have the esports productions, um, you know, you need cameramen, observers, people who understand how to stream to various different channels. But when you think about esports teams, a huge aspect of their organization will be around content creation. How can you create um, everything from, you know, graphics, animated graphics, videos, documentary series, um, or even podcasts and audio formats and create these 
a uh, different piece of content to, to draw in fans, not only build a fan base, but continue to engage fan bases uh, over time so that you can talk to sponsors and talk about how your team uh, has X many fans and how you engage them on the regular and how you can integrate their brands into it. So, so it's really a case of, yes, there are players and teams in the esports ecosystem, but it's so much broader than that. There are event organizers, production crews, and then this whole new world of influencers and streamers and the, the video and you know graphical content creation that comes around that as well. Um, here, Shadow of the Step has one more question. <laughs> Do you have any tips for ambitious young people hoping to enter the industry? Put your name out there. You know? uh, if you've got a skill and you feel like uh, what you can do is good. Uh, put your name out there, start practicing. And if you're not getting picked up, create something yourself, right? If you want to start, uh, you know, practicing event organizing, well, you know, start small scale, put together a plan and, you know, see what you can make do from it, right? Like, Get yourself out there. Start trying to make something happen rather than sitting back on your laurels. I used to sit back on my laurels and I used to try to wait for these opportunities to come to me. But uh, through the... Uh, so I've been playing Hearthstone for five years. Uh, through the first half of that, I sat back and I just let opportunities pass me by uh, because I just never put my name out there. I didn't have a team for the longest time because I never put my name out there and I never tried to explore all these different opportunities that were possibly open to me. So uh, unless you try to do something about it, uh, it's not going to happen. you got to try to get out there and you got to try to get up and at them. Yeah, and, and what I would add to that is... Try to understand, you know, what specific aspect of the industry you want to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it's esports is extremely broad these days. As as I mentioned earlier, there's everything from being a player to a coach to production to content creation. Um, find find your niche, whether that's being a professional player if you're really good at a game, or uh, if you enjoy games and you have skills and kind of video editing that might be your niche and building out that skill in the in the context of gaming and esports so yeah put yourself out there be proactive and find the niche that you're going to fill find where you can add value to you know teams organizations uh, even game publishers so awesome um, I did have a question, you know, uh, if, if there's anyone else that wants to ask a question for us, you just drop them in. Mm -hmm. I had a question, just curious. It sounds like you, you're quite into uh, karate, martial arts, was it? Yes. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about how you find or do you see any parallels between how you think about and how you, how you train for Hearthstone compared to, you know, martial arts and, and that side of things? I, you'd think that when it comes to martial arts, that I'd be a very competitive person that I'd always try to, you know, do the best. But uh, it's actually kept me relatively grounded where uh, before, you know, it was about trying to be the best person. Well, now it's trying to be the best person that I can be rather than trying to, uh, you know, be the best out of everyone there is out there. It's about trying to train myself up to be, a much better person, you know, trying to not focus on what others are doing, but trying to reflect and and self improve from that. So that's probably one of the better takeaways that I've taken away from my martial arts and everything like that. And uh, trust me, as a teacher of martial arts, I've always there's always something more to learn, if not from the uh, from the actual martial arts side, but from the teaching side. It's that, as I said before, there's always something to learn from it. You know, you'll always have students that'll come at you with uh, unique problems that you've never encountered before. Just like in many circumstances, you'll encounter situations in games that you'll never have encountered before. And it's all about trying to problem solve and trying to figure out, uh, you know, what you think is the best way or the best solution to this problem that you might have. Yeah, yeah. And do, do you see parallels between that and how you think about and interact with Hearthstone? Absolutely. I think it's uh, uh, earlier on, I was very, uh, 
I was very, uh, very steadfast in my way in that. I said, I'm right and everyone else is wrong. And that mentality is really <laughs> shifted throughout the current years where it's more or less, uh, you know, I feel like I'm right. But I'm going to listen to everybody else and hear what they have to say. And I'm going to, you know, try to base a conclusion off of that rather than just shutting out everyone else. Uh, just like in martial arts where, you know, someone would say to me, hey, I think you might be doing, you know, I think you might be able to improve, uh, say, a kick that you're doing here. And I'll say, no, I'm doing it right. And then <laughs> in the current years, it's always been more of a sense of, all right, let's listen to what you have to say. And sometimes people have been correct and I'll, I'll improve because of that. It's all about keeping an open mindset and just listening to what people have to say. Yeah. And uh, one, one final question, I guess, about your Hearthstone training, per se. Um, Hearthstone is a single-player game. It's a, it's a one-on-one game. Um, how do you find... Uh, is the best way to train how do you practice how do you uh, come up with new uh, combinations of decks to 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 trial out do you have a training partner is there a certain level of teamwork required to train for Hearthstone, or is it really a case of you're you're doing things solo i typically find that for the most part a lot of success is had with uh, more of a group sort of mentality where there are a lot of different ideas pulled together and you, you know, you spread out the ideas and you say, all right, what's working for me? And maybe in the case that the group may not agree on the same sort of thing, but there'll definitely be the ideas there. Uh, you know, two heads are better than one sort of mentality. Um, as for the, men uh, as for the training side of things, it would be very regular that I would say, do a little bit of content creation. Say I might do a stream for a bit, I may take a break and then later on during the evening, I might do a little bit of practice and, you know, focus on specific aspects with a training partner that I may have. Uh, I know that uh, Deckers, who is in the chat right now, is actually uh, one of those training partners that I had many years oh, back awesome. and is, uh, you know, here to listen to me doing the talk. So a little bit of a shout out to him in there. Um, and yeah, I think that for the most part, it is important to be able to practice with others and share ideas and uh, be able to listen and take feedback. And there is definitely a team aspect of it where, you know, they may want to practice something that you don't feel is necessary, but you take the time out to make sure that you feel like they're ready sort of thing because you want them to succeed. Uh, there's definitely that aspect as well. Uh, if That's you're compassionate... Right. Uh, I know that some people are, but, you know, that's completely different. Uh, but I suppose that's just the approach that I've always taken to sort of, you know, I feel yeah. like being able to take time off of the game and being able to think about it outside of the game rather than just solely focusing on just mindlessly practicing but not improving from it uh, is a big aspect of it. Yeah, and, and I guess I was just kind of asking you that question to, to highlight to, to the viewers that even though some esports titles are single player like Hearthstone, when it comes to the training and kind of figuring out how to improve, how to get better, what's strong, what's not, it does end up generally being a collaborative process. You need to have training partners. You need to have people who are willing to trade time in that way. You want to try something, they want to try something. So it is really cool to see that that is the case. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, it looks like there isn't many more questions in the chat, so thanks so much for jumping on. We'll, we'll, uh, I'm going to do a small uh, talk about Meta, and then uh, we'll bring you guys back on to see if there's any final questions. Thanks, for Wonderful. Seeing. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, that was Frosty, professional legacy player. He plays Hearthstone, which is a one-on-one -on -one card game. Uh, I think it's always interesting to hear from kind of current pro players around what the state of the scene is like and what their training is like. Um, when it comes to training in esports, a lot of teachers and, and school leaders don't quite understand what that means. Um, and getting insight into that can show the parallels there are to sports and, and other extracurricular activities that, that students do that mainstream people do understand. So you heard a little bit about what it's like in one of the schools in Adelaide. You heard from pro player 
I'm just going to talk very briefly about Meta High School esports. You know who we are, and what we do, and how the season's panning out. Um, we're a group that runs high school tournaments. We're trying to bring esports to schools in the same way that schools all have sports programs. We want to help and create an ecosystem where sport schools have esports programs as well. Um, you know. Our philosophy is essentially we know gaming and esports continues to grow. A ton of high school students play video games, um, and we want to find ways to support schools to engage their students through their passion of of video games. And esports is one way to do that. Um, so we've been running for about three years. Uh, we run competitions across Australia and New Zealand. Um, as mentioned earlier in the broadcast, we do League of Legends. Uh, Rocket League and NBA 2K, uh, and this year our season starts April 20th, uh, and NBA 2K will start two weeks after that. So there's still some time to register, and all the information can be found on our website metahsc.gg. I'll put that in the chat as well. And essentially, the whole idea is to register a team. You'll need uh, students and teachers to, to both be involved. We want to make sure that schools and teachers are across what's happening. Um, a teacher needs to kind of register, approve students' participation, and we have a portal where tournament schedules and operations are all handled there. So if you have any questions um, around the season or meta and how it all works, you can always reach out to me through my email. You can head over to our website to find out some commonly asked questions. Um, and yeah, we really hope to continue to see more schools get involved. Uh, yeah, and then as Toby's just jumped in there, the Teachers Hub, we have some frequently asked questions there. So um, it's a great resource to have. And yeah, that that's kind of a lot of the content for today. So I'll bring uh, Frosty and Toby back on for a bit. If there's any more questions in the chat, feel free to ask either any of us and we'll, we'll drop in some answers. Um, I'll have a few questions uh, while we wait. And if there's not too much else, then we'll kind of wrap it up there. So Toby and Frosty, we'll, we'll look to bring you guys back on. Whoa, right. whoa, why am I bumping the pyramid here? <laughs> so uh, Toby, how do you find uh, Frosty's content? What do you think of it all? Yeah, no, I was listening quite intently uh, and also, um, you know, viewing the, the chat with a, with a smirk uh, as well. Um, I certainly uh, can relate to a couple of things that you guys talked about uh, in that, um, that concept of being open to listening to opinions of others, uh, you know, is something that you know, I, I've had to work on, um, you know, myself uh, as a younger person um, and, you know, everyone's got something to offer. Uh, but if you turn yourself off to listening to it, then you never know what they've said, so you can never consider whether that's you know going to help you or not. So I definitely um, was you know nodding intently in the background here uh, when when Frosty was talking about that. Um, I actually saw you nodding off in the background. It was a little <laughs> bit distracting for me as well. You know, as as trying to watch the screen here and like look at my notes as I was talking, and then yeah, I just yeah. see off in the side there is just nodding in the background. I'm going. Uh, 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 <laughs> Um, yeah, and also uh, the concept or the, the conversation around um, like a broadcast uh, as, as a career opportunity is obviously something in our space we... we yeah, I was just uh, about to bring that up with and, you. ...and think about, so I'd say definitely. Um, and, and probably, I think, one of those things about you know, production crews are big. There's, there's different jobs for everyone based on what your strengths might be um, that are out there and production skills in esports uh, will also often cross over to many other areas uh, of production and we know, you know media entertainment industry is quite large um, in every country uh, you know whether it be for esports or for you know other sports or just in other other aspects of media in general so if you can run a camera or you know run a switch or you know, do cabling and infrastructure, or if you are good with uh, bump in, bump out, setting up stages, or good with graphics, there's, you know, jobs for you in, in many industries, not just esports. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You know, when it comes to audiovisual stage setup, event setup, you know, esports is definitely something that's growing and something that has these things happening. But you know, music festivals, like oh, yeah. uh, other conferences, all, all, there are so many things that require that same skill set. Um, so if you can find your niche, and, and you know, whether it's a cameraman or or understanding how to work switches for sound or, or video. These are all things that can be applied across a broad spectrum of industries. Um, Sharing a misstep had a real question, apparently, about how competitions over here, being Australia, um, are held, because he, I hear a lot of horrors about connections and OSH, are tournaments mostly LAN or online? Um, so for Meta High School Esports, um, how we run the competition is most of the rounds are online. Um, there are a certain finals events where we hold uh, in person, and it's not really due to any connection issues. It's more just that um, we find when we have the online rounds, it means more schools can get involved. Uh, whether you're a regional school or a metro school, you can compete all the same. There's, there's no longer that uh, obstacle of distance in the way. And the reason we do the live finals aspects is we still want to create a bit of atmosphere and we find it's really effective to bring teachers and parents along to the live event so they can actually see something and feel something a lot more tangible than when their uh, you know, student or child is just playing and competing online. And when they see it in person, when they see the students reacting and you know, kind of interacting with each other, competing, communicating during the game, it becomes a lot more real to them and I think that's when we have the most impact in driving the conversation of perception forward is when teachers and parents see students competing IRL. Um, they see the fist bumps, they see the emotions, and, and that's really good. So, uh, yeah, Australian is not the best, uh, but I think with games, especially that have Australian servers, it's, it's okay for us to have these local competitions. Uh, any thoughts, Frosty? Uh, well, I was actually going to speak more from the student aspect. Uh, for the students as well, it's also going to be a huge deal for them uh, to be able to experience what a live event is like and uh, be able to experience the atmosphere that you were saying before, where it is a little bit more high octane than it usually would be. Uh, stakes are a lot higher, you know, uh, a little bit of pressure there. But it's also good experience for them as well. And something that I wish uh, a lot of students had the ability uh, to go out there, and I wish it was a little bit more open uh, for a lot more people. So uh, in doing this, I feel like it's just such a wonderful opportunity for them, and I think that uh, what you're doing here is great. Yeah, I think that that's a big part of it. You know, like, for us, as I mentioned earlier, it's all about bringing gaming and esports into schools, helping schools support students and their passion, and draw valuable lessons out of them because now instead of playing solo queue or whatnot at home you're playing in a structured environment the stakes may be a bit higher you're representing a school you're training with your team right um but yeah that's a great point it, you know a, a lot of esports players don't get stage experience because for a lot of the earlier years and earlier levels of play amateur esports on the way up to being a pro you pretty much don't have opportunities to play in front of a live audience um in a live in a live setting so as this infrastructure continues to grow it just means that next generation of professional players will have more and more experiences like stage experience team team based training things like that which will hopefully mean the next generation of players are continue to be better than the previous generation as well naturally <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh so it looks like there aren't too many more questions, so I just want to say thank you again to Toby and Frosty for jumping on, taking out time tonight, and thank you everyone for, for jumping on Twitch and checking out the online version of the teacher information session. Hopefully you all found it valuable. Um, and if you have any feedback, feel free to contact me uh, on email. Uh, it's, it's on the website, but I also type it in chat. And yeah, have a good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, guys.